Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome to this week's recap video. It's a beautiful day today and it was a pretty nice week. We had a couple of days over 100, which those days are a little hard. Mm -hmm. I mean, thank goodness we don't deal with humidity, so it doesn't feel as bad as those of you guys who deal with high humidity. But um, yeah, it does get a little bit like stressful <laughs> on plants and stressful on us. But today's supposed to be 95, but our high is at night. So tonight's high, I just checked, is 58. So we swing usually anywhere from 30 to 40 degrees from nighttime temperatures to daytime, but it takes all day for it to reach its high. So like 95 is supposed to be at like 7 p.m. tonight, um, and it takes all day to get to that temperature. So our stuff and ourselves get a nice break. It's really nice out here this morning. That's why we're in the sun porch. Let's just jump into the videos from this past week, uh, starting with planting containers, dealing with spider mites, and one plant per pot project. So in that one, planted a bunch of containers, a bunch of stragglers that I hadn't done yet. In fact, I have three more that still have pansies. Oh, really? Still, right now, have pansies in them. Um, I also found some spider mites on hollyhocks when I was planting some containers to block off an area that's actually just off this sun porch. So I sprayed those. They are still there. I'm gonna spray them again probably today or tomorrow. They're so beautiful, I can hardly, like my, my thought process with the whole spraying of the spider mites was, like these are covered in adult spider mites. If I cut them back, cause cutting back and getting rid of the plant is the best method of attack. Like if you can bag those up and get rid of them, um, that's the best because it's almost impossible to spray every single spider mite. I mean, you'd have to submerge the plant. I mean, there's so many nooks and crannies in a plant and if you miss just two spider mites mm -hmm. or one spider mite, they'll repopulate the, the space so, so quickly. So I just thought my rationale behind it was to spray them so I'd kill the adult activity present so that when I did cut them back, I wasn't spreading adults everywhere. Cause when you mm. cut stuff back, it shakes the plant and like, you know, spider mites fly through the air. That's how they get from one plant to another. Like they'll go on wind or if they get bumped or whatever. Whoa, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> um, so that was my thought process. I kill the adults, cut the plants back so I don't spread a bunch of adults and then they'll reflush and grow again. They're so gorgeous though that I'm having a hard time and I'm hoping that maybe if I hit them again with some spray that maybe I can control them enough. I don't know. Oh, and then also we did the one plant per pot project where Aaron, you picked out all of the plants. Yeah. They're looking good. They really are. I've had to, I think I need to troubleshoot drip in two of the containers. Just not enough. Yeah, like one of the lantanas on the right side, it's either like that really hot windy day that we had might mm -hmm. have hurt it a little bit, but it'll be fine. It'll be fine, I think. So yeah, Aaron picked out all of the plants uh, for that project and the whole goal of that project is just to show you what plants can do just on their own. One plant mm -hmm. in a pot and you don't necessarily need to pack your containers out with stuff. And I do like that it was successful last year. Yeah. I like I, that. Like, do you remember when we went to uh, Pleasant View in uh -huh. New Hampshire and they had all the, I think they were like hanging baskets or maybe pots, I'm not sure. But they mm -hmm. had like a ton of different plants. They were trialing them. They were trialing mm -hmm. them. And I think that looks really good actually to have an entire container full of just one plant. Mm -hmm. Even if you plant three of that plant to make mm -hmm. it more full, you know, right off the bat. Mm -hmm. But I think that's kind of like, it's cool because sometimes when you've got a lot of plants in a container, it can kind of just be a lot to your mm -hmm. eye. When you see a lot of one thing, it's more striking. Yeah, for sure. Dana said, I'm so with Erin. I love how restful one plant per pot is to my eyes. I also love how supportive you are with each other. Oh, we are supportive. We are, yes, all the time, 100% of the time. <laughs> On camera, we are 100% supportive. <laughs> uh, Robin says, where do you get the large square metal container in the hidden spot? And what type of grass do you have planted? It looks so green and looks soft. So the large square, large square metal container I got at an antique store at um, Enchanting Objects in Boise. It's one of our main stops whenever my mom and I go antiquing. I got it for $50. And it is this massive trough that's gorgeous. It kind of has like, a, like an X detail on the front and then it has handles, but it's super thick metal. I was just like, are you sure you want a $50, that's it? It's a good I, price for it. I know, I did not argue. That's a huge container. Um, it's really fun to plant. The type of grass we have is a Kentucky bluegrass perennial rye blend. But Aaron, you've been dealing with some kind of native. I think it, I think that it's quack grass and it's like real thick kind of tubular grass that comes up and then the blades kind of splay out from the tube. So the tube is like the bloom stalk, right? Yeah. It's like a, a tube stalk uh -huh. and then uh, blades that kind of like furl off of it mm -hmm. at different points. And what happens is 
um, when you mow it, it kind of the top of it kind of just like looks brown, and it's not comfortable to like walk on or or touch. And there's it's all over, it's everywhere. So I looked up online, and people are like, well, there's really nothing you can do besides like round up your whole lawn and start over. Oh, I'm not going to do words. that. Yeah, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> yeah, but because um, it's more drought tolerant, it's like a type of grass that just kind of grows natively a lot of places, mm -hmm. like on the sides of the roads and stuff like that. So they said to just mow it as short as you feel comfortable mowing it because it, it likes to grow tall. It doesn't like to continue to be cut. So mow it short, fertilize often because it's one of those grasses that you know, it's like sedums, you know, like they really don't want a ton you of fertilizer. You can kill them with kindness. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. one of those grasses that doesn't like a lot of care. Mm -hmm. So f make sure you're fertilizing on a regimen. Make sure you're cutting it short because it doesn't like that. And then overseed with what you actually want. Mm -hmm. And they said that over a number of years, you can probably get it out of your lawn if you just continue to give it what it doesn't like. The other stuff will kind of bully it out eventually. So that's it what I'm going to do. It looks pretty. I mean, yeah, the lawn doesn't look bad, and honestly, I think it's already even looking greener. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not too worried about it. I'm just gonna keep keep mowing, keep fertilizing, mm -hmm. and I'll just keep every probably fall and winter I'll overseed, and just keep putting down more seed of what I want to be there, mm -hmm. and if I can just kind of bully it out. Are you gonna keep aerating? Yeah, I'll keep doing that too. I also need to do some uh, dethatching, mm -hmm. but I don't. It, it might include a equipment purchase, <laughs> which I'm always down for. Yeah. It does help to have the right tools for yeah. the job. I yeah. mean, hence why we have two gators here yeah. now. I mean, there was no way, I don't even know how we did it without one. Mm -hmm. And they were so, it was such a, uh, an amazing, it was a boon yeah. to our schedule in our, our days and uh, yeah well you know like um at our community college in town they've got a whole fleet of gators mm -hmm. and they've been using those for like 30 years well you add up over time like if you're paying somebody like down at the college you're paying all these people to work the amount of time if they had to walk everywhere yeah you know um that would be insane yeah that's a huge campus though Terry said, any chance you might have another container competition between the two of you? Perhaps you might bring in Paul and or some of the others that work there in for the fun. Thoughts? I think we should actually. Yeah. So we've got all those hay racks still. Mm -hmm. And I feel like we could do some type of a, we don't have to do a competition with that, but mm -hmm. we could, you know, because we've got so many of them. Yeah. And we've got so much fence line that it wouldn't be hard to hang them somewhere it doesn't really wreck the fence the way we had no. we had some like brackets made mm -hmm. that just kind of hug the top of the fence and it didn't stain the fence or anything right so yeah we might be bringing the hay rack project back next year amy said can you please let us know the exact amount of ja uh, cap and jacks you mix up and whether you add dish soap to it to make it stick um we do two ounces to the gallon on the captain jack's dead bug and then we use one ounce of the spreader sticker i, I don't know if it's like turbo sticker or yeah, something like that. I think that. it's called turbo sticker. I can't remember what the label says, but it's a surfactant that helps the cap and jacks adhere to the plant instead of like beating up and rolling off. It just makes the effectiveness of the uh, spray much higher. Uh, so that's what we do. Danielle said, "Could you spray down your newly planted stuff to keep the spider mites from spreading to those things?" Done <laughs> and done. I did it that day. I sprayed the Japanese maples. I sprayed everything in that area, um, minus the roses in the front. There was no pollinator activity on any of the other plants but it was in the middle of the day-ish. It was like kind of still cool. It wasn't middle of the day, it was like morning, it was still cool, but um, there was a little bit of activity in the front and I didn't do any of those. So. Um, Lori said, any concern with the spider mites on the hollyhocks moving to the Japanese maples? Just addressed that. Martha said, where do you find your classic concrete planters? They are beautiful, their concrete really shows off the plants. Most of our stuff is from Unique Stone. We do have a few pieces from Henry Studio, but not as many. Um, yeah, I think we've like tapped Unique Stone yeah. hard. Like I think I've got almost everything that everything I love. Everything of theirs that you like. Yeah, there are a couple more containers. You know, I'm noticing um, right now that as I'm getting ready to set up th more things in the Hartley and the Cut Flower Shed that I could use more pedestals. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something that I'll probably keep my eye out for. And whenever my mom makes an order, probably next year, um, I might 
add on a couple of pedestals because it's very handy, especially if you're doing arrangement videos or you're wanting to take pictures of things. It's nice to have multiple sizes. I mean, I don't know if you can see behind me. I do have a few in here. Uh, I need to move some stuff back in here. And I, I like don't want to move everything out of every space like and just sh shuffle it because mm -hmm. I want to need them up here yeah. too, you know? So anyway. Next video was installing a gorgeous six foot tall fountain. Speaking of unique stone, we ordered this fountain last like summer or fall and um, waited until June for its arrival. And I was so excited. And that's really why, I mean, I can see it right here. It's, it's perfection. And I didn't really want to start planting anything in this front flower bed. One, because we've got a lot of other things going on. But two, I knew that this structural piece, like this is gonna be kind of our big piece in this area. And I didn't really want to plant stuff and then like need to shift the fountain around and have anything in the way. So I'm glad we waited. Mm -hmm. I think it's in the perfect spot. Yeah. I do think we need to figure out a bench situation because I do want to have some seating around it. Um, and that will indicate like if it needs to shift like a little bit this way or that way to accommodate yeah. benches. We do have one el electrical box. Is, um, a it's, a, it's a flush out. It was actually kind of like an accidental thing because we had a, what was it? We had like a, you know, I don't remember now. I don't know why that's there, but it's it's a line that's active. And so it's one of those things that we need to open when we uh, flush out the system and make sure we get all the water like once out. once a year? Because <laughs> it's like you we couldn't, well, we could, we would have to like dig to a different location to figure out it's how to in, cap it's it. It's actually in a perfect spot, really. Yeah. Because we'll put a bench right over the top of it and there's mulch on top of the lid. So we'll always know where it's at. Yeah. There's not mulch on top of the lid right now. It's like when you, um, when we flush everything out, we have to open up all the faucets. So you turn your water off, you open up all the faucets all the way around the campus mm -hmm. and then you, you know, you blow it out and all the water goes out the faucets. It's kind of like that, only it's underground. Mm -hmm. I think I just saw a hummingbird. Oh really? Yeah. They're so fast that if you're not looking right at them, huh. the name of the fountain is the three tier Royal fountain with whispering pool. So you can get the three tier Royal fountain just without the big basin that we got on the bottom. And that basin is an ad additional, uh, like you can get it. It's more like a four tier at this point. Cause it's got, yeah. you know, one, two, three, four layers of water there. Right, Gosh, it spills out of four locations. And it's funny because when we were setting it up, we were like, this pool is not big enough. Like yeah. this thing is going to splatter everywhere. But I think they've got it dialed in. Yeah. Any fountain's going to splatter a little bit that has that many layers of water. The base but, could be a hair larger, but it'd make it a lot heavier too. Yeah, and it's not necessary. Like the water is is falling like this far in from the, yeah. the edges. And when we very first set it up, we were like, oh, it's yeah. going to hit right on the, the, right. the sides. But no, it works out perfectly. I wonder, you know, at a certain point with size, they stop um, making them all one piece. Like this is a one piece base. Yeah. And this is maybe a, like close to as big as they go because otherwise they may crack if they're bigger or are just too difficult to move. Well, like the one down at Andrews down at the garden center, which we've um, showed you before. It's this large horse fountain. And because the logo from Andrews is a horse and rider from way back in the day. Yeah. Uh, anyway. The basin is what, 10 or 12 feet? And it's actually a big plastic, like thick plastic, almost pond liner kind of thing. Mm. And then there are little concrete pieces that just go over the top of it, like a yeah, sleeve. Right. That are, they're just merely decorative. Like yeah. it's not, it's not what's actually holding the water in, which is interesting. I never knew that until they set that fountain up. I always yeah. kind of wondered how that wor works because we worked or we moved concrete around all the time. I mean, I've moved so many fountains in my life and so many concrete containers, but never anything that big. And I, so I had no experience with that. Yeah. But you and Paul figured out the strap thing to get the bowl off yeah, the well, pallet. Yeah, Paul, Paul ran the straps, but we were about to like push it off the pallet and, or try to get under, I forget what we were gonna do. And I was like, I don't think that's gonna work. And so I thought, let's get some straps. Mm -hmm. And he was like, yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> well, it was perfect because then we could, you know, if you yeah. just push it off, then we have to physically then either get the blades under it, which would be hard, um, or try to scoot it. And there's It no worked really that. well putting the straps underneath. It and did. it's on a pallet, so there was plenty of room to get the straps where you needed yeah. them to go. Uh, Asterix said, this is gorgeous. Are you considering adding old-fashioned lamp posts throughout your property to light it up at night? I can imagine strolling through right after sunset being so charming. We do need to add lighting in a bad way. I'm just I've, not sure exactly. I've looked online at those old-fashioned lamp posts because I really wanted to get, you know, it would be fun to get like 10 of them and put them throughout the garden. But 
Um, the only ones that I can find that I like are from the UK, and they are outrageous to have shipped here because mm. they're good size. How, how big are they? They're how? like 10, 12 feet tall, some of them. Like some of the bigger ones, I don't think we would need big ones all over, but some of the cool ones, they have like, there's the main one and then there's a couple that are on the sides. I think we need to be careful though, not to make it look like a park. It's still a home, it's That's still true. a garden. Like it's st still, st st I'm having issues like putting two words together into one. It's still like our, I don't know. I just, I don't want it to feel like Well, I was trying to talk commercial. you into putting in a big flagpole. Yeah. I want to put. I have nothing against our flag <laughs> or putting flags on your home or putting a flag thing. But Aaron, you want to put like this giant thing I want in to our put front like yard. A, like a 50 foot tall American flag. <laughs> oh I think goodness. that'd be cool. With some lights that shine up at it. Yeah. That'd be neat. But then, you know, you see those at businesses and things. Yeah. And I just. Hey, I don't this is a business. Well, I suppose you're right. <laughs> Next comment is from Keeping Up With The Camden. Help me out, people. <laughs> <laughs> Keeping Up With Camden. Maybe some lights in the bottom basin giving it a shimmering glow at night. I love that idea. Yeah. That would be really We just pretty. need somebody to show. I don't know anything about lights that you can put in water. I think we would have to. Well, we'd have to take it apart and run the. The light cord which we're gonna have to do anyway because um to pour the i called somebody i called a concrete guy about doing a pad at some point and he hasn't called me back yeah which you is kind of like people the, in our area the way Ooh. things go it's yeah. like nobody needs work right now everybody's got there's not enough people to do work and everybody mm -hmm. that does the work has so much that they just well no, a little pad for a fountain is like peanuts to somebody yeah. like you know they're doing bigger jobs we should probably diy that Oh, maybe. <laughs> we need up, therapy though. after it. Yeah. Uh, Amy said, what was the gray putty looking stuff you put around the stopper in the fountain and where can you get it? Um, we get that big rolls from the, the concrete companies and it's just like um, fountain putty. I don't even know what the name is. There's never a name on I'll look it. on Amazon and see if I can find something to link mm -hmm. that's, that's It's similar. not like a concrete putty, though. I know there's like that epoxy kind of stuff that you can mix and it kind of turns gray. It's not that because that's more of a more of a permanent solution. This like comes up, up really easily. I have extra to hopefully troubleshoot the fountain by the kitchen because I'd really like that one to run, but that one splatters everywhere. Um, so I'm going to try to redirect the water with Does a little bit of like that putty. Does it have like some oil in it to to make the water not like wick away from it i don't hmm. know but it is handy stuff to have yeah in fact one of the bowls i didn't even use a cork for the water hole i just shoved a bunch of that putty in and just kind of like smeared it out yeah looks better than any cork i've ever used yeah because it matches the concrete right beth said how do you design your spaces is it all in your mind paper digital how do you plan the plants uh you know i wing it for the most part i rarely have a plan um because i just don't operate well doing that and things change so much I did, however, sketch a general plan for the new property when we bought, not the new new property, but the South Garden. When we bought the field out in front of us, we knew we wanted to, you know, have the power lines buried, have a big grass lawn out here. Um, and, you know, we wanted them to look like one, it was all one piece. So we needed to redirect the lane and it was really important to get things sort of like the big things right. The lane right, the, where the cut flower garden is, everything else can kind of like yeah. evolve around that um, and like I was pretty particular on how the orchard fence went in because that indicated everything like it's a specific distance from the fence on either side and it's like 90 feet long and 30 the orchards 35 feet deep 90 feet long uh, wide um, anyway it was pretty specific mm -hmm. 95 feet wide I don't know it's been so, it's been a couple years since I, I actually did that um, so there are some things that I plan out and everything else is completely by sight and I feel like your thoughts on that. Well, I think that if you're planning out a space, you should, we've talked about this before, but I think that getting an overhead shot, like Google Maps, or if you have know somebody with a drone or own a drone, you know, take a photo, just shooting straight down at your property. And if it's a blank slate, you should always plan on infrastructure first. Like if you want a shed somewhere, mm -hmm. are you gonna need to run power to that shed mm -hmm. or water or, 
do you want like a, a vegetable garden somewhere and are you going to need to run water or power out there do you want any fountains mm -hmm. and always start with like the things that are go, going to go under the ground access. first access yeah. yeah it's big for you like the yeah because those sure, things yeah. are extremely expensive to have done after the fact right if it's if it's a blank slate and you have somebody come dig a trench they can do it so much cheaper to just do a quick trench you know run all the infrastructure where it needs to go mm -hmm. first um because it's just so so much faster as opposed to once everything's there it kind of can't be done without ripping it all up again right so always start with the infrastructure first and then do your big stuff like trees and shrubs mm -hmm. and then perennials and annuals. evergreens yeah figure out if you want to block anything off yeah. with evergreens get those things started the things that take the longest amount of time mm -hmm. if you're at somewhere where you feel like you're going to be for a while get them going yeah um because if you wait 10 years to plant the evergreens you're going to wait another 10 years before you really enjoy size. the size mm -hmm. anna said the fountain is beautiful do you have to do any maintenance besides winterizing it yes we will have to clean it periodically it kind of just depends on how they do like the ones out in full sun tend to grow algae the quickest so we need to clean those a little bit more often and like our three tier kensington in the back um doesn't is not running right now because the electrical line was cut when they trenched for the hartley ac uh, which we knew that was going to happen, so we have to have um, electrical rerun, but we're we're redoing that area, so we haven't decided exactly where we want electrical, which is fine because the bottom bowl of that one is all cracked, so I'm going to probably figure something different out. Uh, we do have the one behind the chicken coop that's running, and that one we have to clean probably twice in the summer, and all that entails is just draining the water out, and then I use a a brush mm -hmm. I mean and maybe like the tiniest little bit of bleach every once in a while if it's real bad and I just brush it down hose it out and then plug it back up and fill it in and it usually does a pretty good job what's that stuff that Greg Whitstock gave us uh, is that for algae or is like that for cleaning it's like a, a pond thing it's a well, I, I think it's would imagine pond you could fountain. use it for fountains I think it said pond and fountain yeah you should look at that like a water clarifier thing I'll yeah, I'll put a link to it because or something. It, yeah, it would be nice to not have to do that as often it because this was, one would be a pain. It said it was good for uh, birds and fish, which, uh -huh. I mean, he's in the pond business and he has all types of fish in his mm -hmm. ponds. So he's got to have something that right. isn't going to hurt the fish. Yeah, that would be That'd nice. That'd be bad luck. This would may not uh, algae up quite as quickly. One, if we use that stuff. And then two, it's in the shade. So that's a little bit easier on things when they don't have as hot of water in them. Christy Cottage Garden said, what are you doing at the old statuary that used to be in your front yard before you redid it? It was a fountain with a pretty lady and a fence thing. Uh, we still have those pieces there behind the barn. And I've been thinking about where we should utilize, especially like that fence. I think it would be fun to tuck that in. And yeah. as we get the stone pathway kind of formed in that area too, I think we will have some opportunities mm -hmm. to create some blocks, like some stops for your eye. Mm -hmm. um, so we're just kind of waiting as the, the flower beds and garden evolve, we'll probably incorporate those pieces back in. Uh, Norma said, does that tree shed? Yes. The uh, honey locust that's right above it, it was done shedding by the time we set the fountain up. But I know next spring it's going to be a beast because uh, I love locust trees. In fact, we've just planted three new locust trees out in the south garden. And they bloom in the spring and then drop these tiny little, like, petals or the flowers themselves. I don't know. They just drop all over the ground like a carpet. But they're so small that I don't even really notice it. I would notice it in a fountain, though. Yeah. And I'm wondering if we should just, like, not run the fountain for a couple of weeks, probably. Just, like... Oh, so it's it, I mean, it would plug up that pump so quick. Yeah. Maybe we could build, like, a net tent. Yeah. Like, a fine mesh tent to go around the fountain. Well, I did, after the video, um, I bought a... I think it's Wemo is the brand that uh, turns it on and off. Like I oh, can yeah. turn on and off from my phone. It's like a Wi-Fi thing. And I set it, I did a thing to where it turns off at like 10 at night or 11 at night um, and then turns back on at seven in the morning. So that way we enjoy it, but it's not running and so like wasting water, water yeah, or, you know, if it gets windy mm -hmm. in the evening. Well, that'd be nice too. Like in the, you know, if you don't have it running for a while, you can let this stuff fall and then you can just net it off or scoot it out yeah, right. and then run it again. Next video is hardy geraniums, amazing perennials with up to four seasons of interest. So I had, I think, five different varieties of hardy geraniums to plant out in the south garden and on the west side. And after I got done with that video, I realized how many varieties of geraniums I actually have <laughs> back. Because uh, I thought we removed most of them when we took out the flower beds up here and then took out the flower beds behind the gazebo. But there's actually a bunch in the back formal garden. I've got, uh, and behind the chicken coop, the boom chocolata. 
little fly. Boom Chocolata is massive. Have you taken a look at those? Mm. They're like chocolate brown leaves, purple flowers. They're gorgeous right now and huge. Really? I planted them right at the edge of a border. Mm. <laughs> They're like this tall. Oh. I thought that they were going to be, I don't know why. I mean, I thought I read the tag, but maybe they just have really, to move them. Yeah, I'm going to have to. Well, they're going to have to move because the pallet walkway is going to have to go straight through them. Oh. So I'll move them anyway, but uh, into a more proper location, but not until later this season. They're beautiful, but I could have showed you so many more varieties and hardy geraniums are not like your zonal, like pelargonium, pelargonium, um, like the ones we use in containers that have the big spherical blooms. It's a completely different plant. And depending on what variety you choose, they can give you four seasons of interest because some of them are evergreen. Most of them have amazing fall color and some of them bloom all season long. Some of them bloom early in the season and they have all different kinds of leaf structure. They're just a really interesting plant category to me. Jeff said, thanks for helping me to get over my preconceived bias against these plants. We have a wild form of these that are a weed in our Virginia garden. And I think that this has sourced, soured me against uh, ever tr even trying the improved varieties. You've convinced me. I'm going to plant a drift and see what they can do. That's awesome. I wish you the best of luck. They are amazing plants. You will love them. Simone said, love the music playing in the background. It's so upbeat and seems symbolic of how you are feeling as you, plant you are planting. Where did Aaron download the music from? So Ken usually picks out the music um, and he uses a lot of stuff from Artlist and from Epidemic Sound. So there you go. Cool. Christopher said, I've always noticed the very unique strong smell of pelargonium geraniums or are they zonal geraniums? Kind of the same thing. Like the red ones on everyone's porch in the south. But I'm wondering if the hardy geraniums have the same distinct smell. No, they do not. Midwest Gardener said, with an estate as large as yours, how many employees do you have to weed it? One and a half. Mm -hmm. Yep, we have Paul full time. His sister Bethany works here too part time. I could not do it without them. In fact, Bethany, I thought she was going to be out this week for VBS uh, at church, and I was kind of like, oh, what am I going to do? Yeah, <laughs> we're so busy, and uh, the weeds with the heat have like boomed. It's crazy because I I had weeded the little area around like the maize garden in our cut flower garden, and for you guys in a video, and then three days later, I was standing out there like. It looks like I did nothing, and I swear I just made them worse. I mean, they just, like, yeah. they're coming up with a vengeance. But because you didn't pick them by hand. Probably. I need to get down and, you know, I used a yeah. hoe for that. Dumb. <laughs> it's not too bad, though. None of the weeds ever get super big. Yeah. That's the, the benefit. Well, we'll have two more employees here after a few years named Benjamin and Samantha. Yes, they will have a chore list. Yes. You I had chores. About that last I had night. chores, but it wasn't the same as because you guys. It was almost like living on a farm for you guys because yeah. you had five acres. Uh -huh. We lived in a city lot, so like I mowed the lawn. Like my mom made me do things. Like um, I remember one year I had to pull out a lilac, which was like a step. It was like one of the old lilacs that, that's that gets hard. that gets like yeah. you know twenty feet tall, and it took me like a couple days to get the root ball out. I bet. Well, what were you using? A shovel and a chainsaw? Like a hatchet. Oh, a hatchet. Yeah. Are you serious? Well, I was like 13 at the time. So oh, she was just like, you, you know, head out there and just, here's a shovel and a hatchet and go to work. Oh, man. I used to think that the chores that we got on our list were just the worst. Like, I can't believe my parents are making us do this. Yeah. Slave labor. Yeah. You know, they just had us to weed the orchard wall with all the red ants all over it. Yeah. <laughs> it's uh, the worst one that you could get was going out into the pasture and cutting down thistles. Mm. That was the worst because it was always when it was super hot mm -hmm. and it feels massive. Like now I look at the pasture, I'm like, I'll go cut the thistles down. Yeah. <laughs> like I'll have a, a few minutes of peace and I'll go right. do that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, dibs. Um, but back then you're just like, this is all my life is, yeah. you know, I'm going to be doing this for the rest of my life out yeah. of the pasture and thistles are pokey and awful and yeah, but it, it's good. We had a Saturday chore list that was more extensive. We had daily chores too, because we had rabbits and cats and dogs and cows and occasional horse in the pasture. And so, and we had chickens for a little while. Anyway, we always had animal chores to do every day, sometimes twice a day. This summer, you'd had to go out and put frozen water bottles out for the rabbits mm -hmm. and then go get them at night and make sure the water is fresh and all of that. Um, and then Tuesdays, we would have a chore list too, but it was a shorter one. Yes. Natural Witchcraft said, Laura, is your hair a little more blonde or is it the light? It is a little bit more blonde. Um, we actually, this, let's see, was it January? We did, um, what is it? Balayage? Is that how you say it? Balayage? I don't know. Oh. 
Um, anyway, she added more, Crystal added more blonde into my hair just to kind of, I don't know, just for something different and to see if we could kind of get, because my hair turns that copper penny color no matter what I do. I like it. The copper penny, yeah. do you? Yeah. Oh my goodness, it's just like the sun, you know, I should protect. In fact, we started working on the stone pathway the other day and it was so hot that yeah. day. I wore a hat Yeah. and I just thought, I just have to like force my, and I hated it the whole time, I hated it. Yeah. Um, and I've got to force myself because like I can start seeing like, you know, sunspots a little bit and which I have had looked at, <laughs> so I have stuff to put on them, but you know, so, I don't know, I need to start protecting my hair and my yeah. face and stuff a little bit better. But it's going to be hard for me to do that. Anyway, I, I'm getting a little bit darker. My hair is still pretty dark. Like, I have, like, a tiny little bit of gray mm -hmm. ever since I got pregnant with Benjamin. Um, but most of it's pretty dark still. But then it bleaches out really fast. So I don't know. It's really hard. I think it's probably frustrating to Crystal because she's like, I just, <laughs> like, your hair changes in, like, a week's yeah. time. You get it done, and then, you know, a week later, it's already starting to turn copper. Seema said, I uh, wanted to know something. Doesn't the compost that you use for mulching blow away? It does not. It's heavy enough. It just stays put, thankfully. Speaking of which, we're getting another load, like, shortly. Yes. So Paul almost has the entire, like, big section of the South Garden mulched, like, over the wood chips. It's looking so nice. I mean, a lot of the wood chips are kind of working their way up, and mm -hmm. I think it'll take a few seasons of mulching with compost to cover them completely, but it just makes everything look like more calm or something is that weird well it makes me feel good knowing that you're putting something good on the soil that's gonna you know break down yeah i think i think the plants are gonna like it too the plants look better yeah like they don't look as dry because the wood chips are white get kind of um, blonde loads of land and sea that would take that so would, much i know that would change our that would change the game yeah for us uh, Shannon said, do you guys still use the zone cleanups? But not really. You know, I was thinking for the cut flower garden, we should probably get back into that now that the weeds are picking up a little bit more. But you guys, Paul and Bethany do such an amazing job out there. I do some weeding. Like I go through and do uh, big flower bed cleanups like I just did one yesterday. And then uh, every evening, like last night, Benjamin and I were out and I deadhead and I'm weeding areas. Not in any specific way. I just try to like, when it's really hot, we try to work where the shade is. So you kind of, things go out the window a little bit when it's so hot. Um, anyway, we haven't really done a zone system, but uh, things are working pretty good at the, at the moment. Next video is adding phlox, astilbe, and calicanthus to the garden. Just had a beautiful load of stuff I wanted to share. The calicanthus is a brand new plant to me. So far, it's doing really well out in South Garden in full sun, even with all the heat. And it's got like deep pink, almost red, looking blooms. I asked you, I'm like, does this look red to you or pink? And you said mm -hmm. pink. So I was like, done. I'm yeah. going to put this in the, in the garden. And it does add a depth of color and it's perfect where it's at because it's right in between like a blue ju juniper, um, a black lace elderberry. There's a fluffy arm nearby and some birch that have the yellow color. Just really pretty. Um, the phlox are in full bloom and it was the opening act romance. There's like amazing color. And I like that color a little bit more. We did one earlier this season out in the South Garden. I cannot remember the name, but it was like that bright. It was raining. Mm -hmm. Remember that phlox I planted when it was yeah. just pouring? I'm not sure that I'm sold on that color. Mm. It is so bright that it's kind of like, oh, I can tend to want things that are a little less. I think in that area, it'll kind of, I mean, it'll be bright, but there will be enough stuff from the house that block it that you won't really see it unless but you're just out there. But then you'll go around the curve and you'll be like, oh my goodness, that's <laughs> <laughs> such a bright flower. Well, you can always move it somewhere else. We can, else. yeah. I or, just... or rehome it. There's always, yeah. that's the thing. It's always nice to have friends that you could just be like, here, these you plants. Want, do you want these flocks? <laughs> yeah. Um, I actually bought two Boscobel roses, David Austin roses, this spring from the garden center. And because I had transplanted five from by in front of the gazebo, three of them took beautifully, two of them did not. And I didn't get my hands on them last year, so I finally got them this spring, and I didn't get around to planting them until they started to bloom. And I'm so thankful I waited because they bloomed. They were not Boscobels. They were the mislabeled. Red. I think the whole lot came in mislabeled. Oh. Um, and they were like so vivid, deep, I mean, it was just like this kind of the same thing. Like, is that red? I don't know. Yeah. Like, it's jarring to my eye. But I have a friend who wanted to Could they have been mislabeled a... at Andrews or from David Austin? I don't think that... The, I mean, anything is possible. But the, the process that they go through there, once they get their bare root, I just don't think it could... 
it could have happened. Yeah. Because you do them in lots. You pot yeah. them in lots and you're not like pollinating the plant. You're not cross Well, they probably have tags on the stems mm -hmm. too. Yeah. Camera shut off. Sorry about that. We were talking about... Uh, I was just saying David Austin would probably want to make sure they did everything they could to where um, if you were potting up bare root roses, you didn't get them mixed up. Right. So I'm sure they have tags on them. Yeah, I'm just not sure what happened there. But anyway, a friend ended up with those. So I'm glad I didn't plant them next, next to my boswells though. And been like... Yeah. Ah. Uh, Laura K said, Laura, I did it. I just heard that after many years of struggle, I'm going to graduate. Congratulations. It sounds strange maybe, but your videos were such a respite, 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 every day. When I felt low and thought that I couldn't go on, this channel was a safe space. Thank you, Laura and Erin. That is amazing to hear, and I'm really happy for you. Way to go. Susan said, it looks like you place your plants uh, below the level of the natural soil. Is this how you do it? Also, is it safe to plant so close to tree roots? Um, we, I know it appears that we're planting them lower, but it's all the stuff that the auger kicks out of the holes. Uh, it needs to just kind of be smoothed mm -hmm. out, which is something that usually I do. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, depending on the camera angle, there might be like a little bump of soil like next to the plant. That well, naturally, that's where all the soil goes as you're using the auger. Yeah. So it's if you were using a shovel, it wouldn't look that way. Right. But you're generally putting it at the soil level. Well, at soil level, yeah. Um, and you know, we mulch too. And then when we come through with drip right after as well. So if we notice any issues, we can kind of fix that at that time. But camera angles are weird sometimes too. Mm -hmm. You can't really show a full picture unless like you're there <laughs> with me looking at the plant. Um, also, is it safe to plant uh, so close to tree roots? We do it all the time, all the time. If I run into a tree root, I don't cut it to plant something typically, unless they're like little itty bitty roots, I'll blow through those really easily if it's a yeah. big established plant. But um, if I run into anything of size, I'll just scoot the hole over so I can plant it near yeah. that spot, but not right on the root. Susan said, I just recently planted some sky pencil Japanese holly. They are recommended for zone six through nine. Would you consider planting these since you just recently moved to a zone six? I think you would love them. I don't know. I don't know if I would or not. Not because I don't like the plant, but I don't trust our zone six. Oh. I think it's just because I grew up in five. Well, Holly also doesn't seem to like love our climate. They like a more acidic uh, soil. So it'd have to be something we'd have to work on. So with those factors against it, I probably, I wouldn't do it in any kind of like hedge situation or like very focal point sort of situation. Those things for focal points, I use things that I know will survive. Unless something, I mean, something could happen to anything. Starla said, love everything you did. I wondered if you could address the problem that so many have had this year with contaminated soil. Has it happened in your area? Can you tell us how to avoid it? Um, you know, it hasn't happened in our area to my knowledge. I did watch uh, recently Jess from Roots and Refuge. She put out a video because she got a load of contaminated soil and I can't remember what company she was working with. Company was she mentioned it was well. like um, soil three. Was it? I've never heard of it before. She wasn't shading the company at all because the company was trying to help rectify the situation yeah. and, and all of that. And that is just like the hugest bummer. I can't even, oh, yeah. I just felt for her um, on that situation. I don't know unless a company had like super rigorous testing. Yeah. Like, I don't know how you would know. You know, we use pretty much all, Almost exclusively a Spoma. Yeah, a Spoma products. We do have, we have been... Um, mulching with bulk compost. So we are getting bulk compost that we're using as a mulch, but we're not using it as a planting medium, And that's coming from the other side of Oregon. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. I mean, it's possible if it, you know, if they change, Clint and Julie changed their source or something and didn't know. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know unless you test every batch of stuff that comes through your place. And I mm -hmm. don't know how feasible of a thing that that is. So, yeah, that is just one of those things that... That is just it's the worst. I suppose as like a, if nobody's ever heard of what's going on, like some people are reporting that soil has been contaminated with um, like, like sprays, uh -huh. right? I can't remember the name like, of it. Reneg, is it Reneg? It's got something in it. I don't know, uh -huh. but it's, it's causing plants to look like they've had spray damage. Mm -hmm. Like they've been sprayed with mm -hmm. Roundup or herbicide. Damage. Herbicides. Uh -huh. Yeah. Something. So it's like the plants are burning once you plant them in the soil. So how many other people have reported it? Do you know? 
Well, you know, I've seen a couple of Facebook groups that have popped up. Oh, really? Uh, like, um, you can join the Facebook Come group. Commiserate with yeah, us. Yeah, it's, well, <laughs> yeah. and people that are trying to get down to, like, what soil have you been using, yeah. what, you know, things like that. So, I don't really know how widespread it is, but the, the only main person that I know, you know, is Jess mm -hmm. from Roots and Refuge. So, mm -hmm. I don't know. Kathy said, do you use biotone when planting all things? Yes, I do. Beth said, does Aaron not like sunflowers? Yeah, Aaron, what's your problem? <laughs> I don't like sunflowers that come up in beds where they're not supposed to be. I like intentional flower beds. I, I also like nature. I guess what I like is I like, I like one or the other. I don't like a little bit of one or a little bit of the other. I'm kind of an extreme person. Like I want it to be extremely natural or extremely contrived. Does that make Disneyland sense? Disneyland or the woods. Yeah, right. It's like, I love Disneyland, but I also like a meadow that hasn't been touched by a soul. Yeah. So. See, I like both of those too, but I like a little bit of a mix. Yeah. Mm hmm I like things and too. I, I get that. I mean, that's fine. Mm -hmm. But to me, it's kind of like once you start messing with it, it's like um, old homes. You know, once you start renovating an old home, to me, it's like, well, you're already doing some, like you're changing out some things. So like. If something's not working for you, like just get rid of it because you're, you've already messed with it. You guys should hear Aaron's renovation thoughts for our house. <laughs> like, should we just build a new one? <laughs> well, yeah, there's yeah. like some old touches to this house, but a lot of the old, I mean, there's some like dark wood molding that's kind of cool. Mm -hmm. And I think that we could continue with a, a dark wood molding, but there's not enough of what we currently have and you wouldn't be able to match it exactly. Mm -hmm. So. Like, why not just re redo it? I don't know. Mm -hmm. I know, it's a hard one. It is tough. I just staked up a sunflower that came up in one of our race beds yesterday yeah. that I planted beans below it. Well, people that don't know, I roguied out a, uh, a sunflower in a bed where it wasn't supposed to be growing. But it was already like five, six feet tall. Yeah, but it wasn't supposed to be there. But it would, and it didn't it make any sense in, in like that bed. two weeks. And I could use it for a cut arrangement. And then we could have But you it. have, like, you that year especially, you had, like, hundreds of other sunflowers. Perhaps. <laughs> Next video was new garden update, weeding, thinning seedlings, and planting. So in that video, I was out in that one quadrant in the cut flower garden where we put the arbor up and the brick kind of raised beds and then created the maze with the sunflower and sunflowers and corn. At this moment, most of the corn is up. Most of the sunflowers have popped through. Um, a lot of weeds, a lot of new weeds are um, coming up. And it's funny, Samantha and I were out there like a couple days ago and I was watering because I, even though we have drip tape in there, we only run it once a day and most things only need it once a day. So I go in with the hose to water the seedlings because we don't want to run the water for everything. Um, and so she, I knew she was behind me and just for like one minute, I was watering the plants and I turned around and she had in her hand a whole bunch of the bunny tails grass that I had just planted below the urns because of those soft, fuzzy tops. She mm. loves soft things. Like it is her jam. Yeah. Like if you put a fleece or a, not like a fur, like a faux fur blanket on the, the ground, she will plow her face into that and just like she loves it. So she saw those grasses and she just is drawn to them. Yeah. She was when they were in their flat in the greenhouse. I had to like get after her for pulling them out of the, the trays. And so she had pulled a bunch up. She had them in both of her hands like, look what I just got. <laughs> Tried to replant a All bunch of them. Of <laughs> she was proud of herself. And I thought it was cute. They're like, well, this is the perfect thing to put in a kid's garden. It's yeah. very tactile and very yeah. just like perfect. Uh, Deborah said, I still hope that you get your family together for a tomato tasting. I would love to hear your dad's thoughts on the different tomatoes. I'm sure some delicious cocktail recipes would also be re revealed. Yes, I'm sure they would be. Uh, tomato testing would be really fun. Yeah, Bethany we should totally do that. Yeah, Bethany and I were just talking about that yesterday. We were looking at some of the smaller tomatoes are starting to like get close to ripening. There's Boss Blue Bumblebee and then a strawberry, black strawberry, I think. Um, there's a few out there that are really interesting looking. And we were talking about how they look cool, but hopefully they taste good as well. Midwest Gardener says, what do you do with all the food you plant? More than enough for several families. Yes, we give away what we do not use. Uh, Sess Wood said, do you thin the zinnias at all? Sometimes. <laughs> Most of the time, nah. <laughs> That's too much work. And they do fine. Like, I don't know, last year we had zinnias like crazy. Mm -hmm. And I had started one tray from seed, which the benefit of, of starting zinnias from seed is that you can get blooms earlier and you can get your spacing all proper and all of that. 
but you know when you just sprinkle the seeds in and water them they pop up so fast once it's warm enough and I just let them grow thick and they were amazing like amazing and they kind of support each other um, like they don't they don't need staking or any kind of like I know a lot of people use maybe not with zinnias but that hortanova I don't even know if that's how you say it hortanova uh, it's like horizontal netting that flowers can grow through anyway so if we have time we thin if we don't we just don't things tend to do okay Lori said can you transplant can you not transplant the corn to a different area or will it die instead of using the pruners and killing them um, at that stage it would not be worth it to dig I mean the roots are so intertwined with each other because those seeds are planted close together um, that it would probably damage the one I wanted to keep if I tried to pull them apart to go transplant the other one. Corn just doesn't transplant very well most of the time, uh, unless you can get like all of its root ball and some soil around it and that sort of thing. Uh, so we just plan to thin. You know, we put two seeds in every hole knowing that we're only gonna leave one in the event that, and as I got down the, the line of corn, not every single seed had germinated. So there were some I didn't have to thin. And that's why you wanna do more than one seed just in case. Michelle said no watermelon this year or did I miss that video? We do have one wa watermelon coming up in the middle of a patch of annuals we planted. Paul just took a picture of it. It's in that corner where we planted the yellow cannas. Oh really? I told him just to let it go. Yeah. Let's see what happens. I decided not to purposely plant any watermelon this year. I can get them to grow. Like I can get them to grow and I can get them to set fruit. Picking them at the right time is such an issue for me and I don't know I don't know why I need a lesson I need somebody to come here and give me a lesson I can't watch videos about it like I need somebody to be here physically that's yeah. how I learn and um, anyway I just have dedicated so much space to it I thought no I can buy better ones somebody else can grow them we'll make room for something else out here like I can I know when to pick tomatoes let's plant a lot of tomatoes Abby said did you get corn from your greenhouse experiment we did I did give a number of them to the chickens um, we ate some of them. They formed up pretty well. Um, the very tops of them, you know how like if they don't get fully pollinated, like the tops won't be all the way, you know, kernels all the way to the top. So I noticed that they were a little bit shorter, but they did form up beautifully. I mean, it was a really great experiment. Everything in there did really well. Like the, the carrots probably were the best. They were the best looking crop. They did wonderfully in that raised bed mix because I mean, they were not having to fight through any kind of hard pan or clay and they just formed up like perfection. I need to grow all of our carrots in raised beds like yeah. that with just raised bed mix, that's it. Martha said, you have two different colors of mulch? Yes, we do. So we mulched with the mulch that we had delivered when we had our B&B &B trees delivered early this year, like in what, February? It feels like, like ages ago. Yeah. Um, we had those delivered early to where we didn't we weren't ready to plant them. So we had to hill them in, which just means like putting stuff over their root balls, which mulch is a really good way to do that. At the time, that was the only mulch that Clint and Julie had in stock. So we would have probably preferred a darker mulch because then we could have used it out in our flower beds and it would have matched everything else a little bit better. But we just took whatever they had because it was early in the season. I don't even think they were technically op excuse me, open mm. at the time that we bought that um, and they delivered it. So we used that mulch in the cut flower garden. I just, you put it on Facebook for free. Like anybody who wants to come get it, come get yeah. it. And I saw your post. I'm like, oh wait, I think we can use this in the cut flower garden, just in the rows, just to keep the powder down. It's like not my color choice, but who cares? And I think it looks really good. Yeah. So we've been using the lighter colored wood mulch just to use it up in walking areas. And then we use land and sea around planting areas. And it's kind of fun mm -hmm. to have like that different have the contrast. Look. Yeah. Um, next video was planting a huge load of butterfly bushes. 25 butterfly bushes went in the ground that day. That was a happy day. It yeah. was a hot day, but it was a happy day. We had a, um, can't think of the name of that butterfly. Oh yeah. Uh, was it a monarch? No. It's the other one we get a lot of. Swallowtail. Yeah. Come and land on one of the, uh, pink, one of the Miss Ruby, uh, Budley is. Right before we planted it, I had set the can down in the flower bed. And I couldn't even believe it. I was standing like four feet away and it just came and it was awesome. Kimberly said, such beautiful plants. This year, my boys ages nine and seven decided to do the container contest. We went to our local greenhouse and they chose, they got to choose their own plants. I do have to say their container is winning. So proud of them. That is so, that is so cool. I love that. I want to do that with my kids. Uh, Donna said, don't you have to call dig right in, in your area for utilities to mark where they are? We have had our utilities marked. <laughs> So many times, but oh, like for planting right around the boxes right there, probably is why that Yeah, well, there's asked. a difference between like our own utility, like our stuff versus city utilities. 
So, you know, we can hit our own stuff. The, the point is that you have to call so that, you know, you're not responsible. Mm -hmm. um, so and we're digging like this far down, which, I mean, I'm not, I'm not advocating for not calling dig, dig yeah. line, uh, but we know because that's so freshly done, we know where everything's at there. Um, and yeah. Well, I mean, from working at a cable company, you know, cable lines are often the lines that just go from the box to your house. They're often like three or four inches under the soil. So like if you were digging, you would hit I'd them. hit one. Yeah, right. I hit a cable line once. I yeah. was planting uh, one of those road doll roses that yeah. Aaron sent out. Yeah, so that happens. But um, so yeah, technically every time that you get a shovel in the ground, you should call dig line. But after a while, it's like you, you kind of know where things are because mm -hmm. it's, yeah. Shelly said, have you ever trained a butterfly bush into a tree form? It looks like it could be an alternative to a hydrangea standard. I'm wondering if it was worth trying. Who had, was it Teresa that had the butterfly bush standard? I don't know. She showed me a picture of, maybe? Or she was talking about, look at the bumblebee. Oh, yeah. Boy, that was big. That's like yeah. a bird. My goodness. I'm, I'm so distracted out here. <laughs> There's so many things flying around. Um, no, I didn't even really, it didn't register that there were Budlia tr standards out there until um, a friend of ours was here. And I think it was in her garden. Teresa, you'll have to tell me if it's in your garden. Um, but yeah, first time I've ever seen one in tree form. Mm -hmm. That would be so cool. I've never trained one into Makes that. Makes sense. I mean, because you, you can get a rose in a tree form. Lantana. Or, I've mm -hmm. had lantana in tree form before. That was interesting. They were. Could we grow a coleus in tree form? Like its own stock, or I've seen coleus trees. But was it like like that kinsman thing with the maybe with like a planter ball on the top? I thought it was like an actual coleus. I think they can get pretty big. Yeah, but they're annuals here. But so. they're a good house plant. That would be a Hartley experiment. Oh yeah. Maybe. Uh, Angie said, "What happens if you plant a non-sterile budlia? Does the butterfly bush police show up?" No. So if you ever see a pugster in my yard, nobody. Well, we'd get reported, and <laughs> so somebody report us for planting well, a pugster. Well, I don't know that it's actually wrong to plant one. I think it's wrong to sell them. Yeah, it seems like a gray area to me. Well, if you know that something get oh, you'd get the invasive police on on you. I'm not planting not invasive species. Nope. I don't know. I don't think that there's anything wrong because the thing is, we have access to all that stuff. Like. A couple miles down the road going into Idaho. Yeah. So, I don't know. Ara said the stone path looks lovely, but are you sure that mulch will be enough to fill in the cracks? Here in New England, we would have to dig a trench and fill it with stone dust to properly set the stones and try to prevent frost heaving. But um, even if you don't need to do that m much work in the Northwest, wouldn't it be easier to walk on them if you somehow pack the cracks with stone dust as well as bolstering the edges of the path with some stone dust sloped up to the sides? I would be concerned that the mulch would be too soft in some of the bigger cracks and could be an ankle twister. Everything looks great either way as always. Um, yeah, I mean, things to consider for sure. We, our soil out there is so hard to pack. Like I just. Well, I think that that's probably the way this person is saying it. It's probably correct, you know, but I think the way that we're doing it is fine. It's kind of like the way that you, um, you put the pallet walkway just on the ground and mm -hmm. like it lasted for years and years. And I think it'll be the same with this. Mm -hmm. I think that for our area, it works because the ground is so hard mm -hmm. back there and we don't get enough rain or frost. Mm -hmm. Like we, in other areas they get the rain and then it freezes and it kind of heaves the ground. Mm -hmm. We don't really deal with that here. Mm -hmm. So for our area, I think this method is going to work, but it probably wouldn't work for everybody. However, we are going to go through, like right now, we're just in a process of setting the stones out into the design that we like, but we'll go through and like lift the stone up and shave out or add soil if we need to under each one, just to make sure like it's not tippy um, and it, they're as level as possible with each other. And it's the same way that my parents put their uh, flagstone pathways in so many years ago. I don't even know how old I was. I mean, I was there and I was young, um, but they just kind of set their flagstones out. And I remember it was a big job. For, for us to put those in. And I remember like my dad picking up the rocks, like tipping them and my mom would shave some soil out with the, with the uh, shovel. And anyway, they still look exactly the same today as they did back then. And I remember the contour of the stones on my feet. Mm. Even now it's like muscle memory because I never wore shoes out there as a kid. And I knew exactly how to walk, like run on all those rocks to like the most comfortable spots. I could still do that today. Mm. Yeah. Mary said, here's a thought for your stone path. Could you plant a sedum or, or grass in between the stones? Could be pretty. I think that's a 
really fun idea. I've actually got some really pretty sedums. I don't know that it'll actually go in between the stones, but I know I'll plant some that'll hug the stones for sure. I think that would only work if we had like overhead water or something in those areas oh, in the yeah. summer, it would dry out. Oh, yeah, would work. Yeah, yeah. Probably. Vera said, are you edging the driveway with brick? Yes, eventually. <laughs> if we can get people here. We have other that would projects be, that, would that be nice. are going to take priority, but yeah. eventually. Orchard water being one. Yeah. Uh, Linda said, why haven't you started planting other places other than the South Garden? Can't believe you haven't done anything around the Hartley yet or the new beds around the house. Yeah, I have a few few comments I've been reading lately. Like, <laughs> why are you we're here for this? Like, why aren't you planting? Well, I can't really control anybody else's schedule. We're on everybody's list um, to like Chad's coming back to regrade. He was supposed to be here last week, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So we're just on people's lists and they get here when they can. And we're at their mercy because there isn't any real other options mm -hmm. um, for us around here. So kind of like orchard water. I text Benny yesterday. I'm like, um, <laughs> we need water in the orchard. Where are you at? Uh, anyway, he's supposed to come by today and we'll get it all nailed down. I don't know. But things just take forever around here. And so I can't get frustrated because there's nothing I can do about it. Yeah. And I don't want to be the squeaky wheel. I want people to want to work for us and want to work here. But like you said earlier, people have so much work that, you know, there's no incentive for them to like, come they sooner. just they get here when it makes sense for them to get here you know maybe their equipment like for chad in his case like i think he tries to be as efficient as possible with how he moves his machinery around and i don't blame him with fuel prices and all of that yeah so um anyway we'll just do it when we can we've got the, the boxwoods here we can get that started when when it happens but i am like i'll have moments where i get a little bit frustrated because i'm like oh i just i want this powder dirt to be covered but most of the time i'm pretty good with it like mm -hmm. i'm yeah, it is what it is, and we will just get it done when we can. Yeah. It's fine. The South Garden is like the only space that's just ready to accept plants. Yeah. Everywhere else, you're a little, well, I'm a little tentative to put anything permanent in. Like just behind the chicken coop, I planted some annuals that we had left over. I did that last night with Benjamin. And because I know that I'm going to redirect the pallet walkway at the end of the season mm -hmm. when I can move plants again. And um, yeah, so I feel like nothing permanent can go on until more structure is set. And yeah, like, and like the inside of the Hartley, I'm still waiting on the table. That's supposed to be here in July. So mm -hmm. sometime this next month, we should have a table in there. The countertop still isn't in. That was supposed to be in last week. <sighs> <laughs> but you know what? I just like looking at the structure. So it doesn't even matter. <laughs> Garden yeah. in it, sit in it, look at it. It's just, it's beautiful. I love it. And that is gonna do it for this week's recap. That's it. So we're gonna go out side and probably plant a birch tree that's been sitting out there for a while. We're going to tackle that project today so nice. we can get it on drip, not have to pull the hose out anymore to water it. Hope you guys are having a great day. Have a great week and we will see you in the next video. Bye.